Two weeks ago, as I filmed this, Derek over on Veritasium proposed a physics thought experiment, and today I have made that into a real experiment. He proposed a simple circuit where you have a battery, a switch, and a light bulb, except the wires that connect these components together are really, really, really long and stretch far away in both directions, such that if the power from the battery when you flip the switch had to go all the way down the wire and back, you'd actually be able to see a delay before the light bulb turned on, if you had to wait for light speed effectively to make that round trip. As I watched that video, I was extremely unconvinced. <laughs> I think that his answer, that you don't need to wait for the light speed delay, is technically correct if you use his very carefully crafted definitions, like any current passing through the light bulb constitutes the light bulb turning on. Now, the bulb won't receive the entire voltage of the battery immediately. But I think that there's a whole lot more to this question, and your intuition about the answer is probably not quite as wrong as you've been led to believe. So I'm about to fire this circuit up. I have an oscilloscope that can do very precise timings, and I have about a kilometer of copper wire stretched out in both directions here. And uh, we're gonna see if there's a light speed delay when you flick that switch. All right, so <laughs> full disclosure, I'm filming this over a couple days and it got cold. So if you notice me wearing a coat and then suddenly not wearing a coat and then wearing a coat again, that's why. Okay, so first of all, I need to explain to you how I've set up this circuit and measurement apparatus because it's gonna look a little bit different than Derek's cartoon switch and light bulb. First difference, no switch. When you actually close a mechanical switch, you've got two pieces of metal that are attached to wires that sort of slam into each other. But when they slam into each other, they have a tendency to sort of bounce a little bit, which means that as you flip a switch, if you zoom in on that in time, it's actually going on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. And it sort of bounces, and it means that your signal gets really, really noisy. Considering that I'm trying to see the faintest of transients on a really long line, I wanted it to be as good and smooth and even as possible. So I'm using an electronic switch. I have a transistor here that is going to start five volts flowing in this wire as soon as it receives a pulse. Second change, no light bulb. So, I mean, I'm using a resistor and to be fair, an incandescent light bulb is basically just a resistor. But more than that, by measuring the voltage across this resistor with two oscilloscope probes, I can find out exactly how much current is flowing through that resistor resolved in time. So I can flick this switch, start this thing recording, and know exactly how long it takes for any current to start flowing through that bulb, or resistor, light bulb, whatever. The last critical elements here are, of course, the wires themselves. And I have stretched out a kilometer of wire in two big 500 meter loops on both sides. I, I say a kilometer, it's approximately a kilometer. Uh, actually, the best measurements of the length of the wire so far have come from the oscilloscope, not from the wheel that I've been walking with. If you look at the light speed delay, like how long it takes light to move from here to here, <laughs> directly through space, it's, you know, half a nanosecond. I'm not going to be able to see that time delay from flipping this switch to this thing turning on with this oscilloscope. Uh, because my switch itself takes, you know, 20 or 30 nanoseconds to turn on. So it's just, it happens too fast to see. But for signals to go all the way down that 500 meters of wire and come back, and to go all the way down that 500 meters of wire and come back, that takes a lot longer. And that should be on the order of one and a half to two microseconds, which is an eternity to an oscilloscope like this. So we will be able to see what's going on very clearly. How much current gets there right away, how much current we have to wait for, how much bouncing there is in the lines, and how long it takes for Ohm's law to come into effect. Like how long does it take for steady state DC to take over? So without further ado, let's hook it up and try it out. There's so much noise. Oh, got it. This this is, this is not how this should be done. Oh, look at that. So the light bulb turns on a little bit 
and then after one light speed delay, the light bulb turns on the rest of the way. Let's confirm that. Okay, so this cursor right there, when we see the, the light bulb turn on most of the way, is 1.6 microseconds. 1.6 microseconds times C is 480 meters. That's perfect. We got 500 meters going out that way and we got 500 meters going out that way. That is our light speed delay. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I am really excited about this graph right here, but I realize that not everybody watching is probably used to interpreting oscilloscope traces. So I'm gonna take two minutes and I'm gonna explain what's going on here. An oscilloscope, in a nutshell, is really just an exceptionally fast voltmeter. Like a regular multimeter voltmeter like this, you can put the probes across something and you can see how, like if a battery is dead or something like that, because you can read how many volts there are. This is all this is doing, except it's plotting it over time. All of these graphs are a voltage or potential plotted on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. So if we follow this uh, yellow trace right here, it rides along and then at this particular point in time, the voltage rises from zero all the way up to five volts. This yellow trace is probing the battery and switch together. If you imagine connecting a voltmeter across the battery and switch with the switch open, these probes are actually attached to the same end of the battery, albeit with a really long wire. So the potential difference between the probes is zero. However, after we close this switch, now this probe is immediately connected to this end of the battery. And even ignoring light speed stuff, the wire is resistive enough that we see the full voltage of the battery across these probes. In this case, five volts. For the interested, this particular set of traces was made with this complete hookup. Now what's this white line that I was specifically so excited about? Well, strictly speaking, it's on an oscilloscope, which means that it is a voltage plotted against time. However, I've chosen this voltage in the circuit very carefully. This is actually the voltage drop across the resistor that is representing the light bulb at the far end of the circuit. And because I know the resistance of that resistor, it's one kilo ohm, and I know Ohm's law, V equals IR, or in this case, I equals V over R, I can calculate the current flowing through the light bulb as a function of time. And that's basically what this is plotting. Now, current is literally a measure of how many electrons per second are flowing through a particular electrical component. So in this case, we see that after about a microsecond, there's somewhere in the vicinity of a fifth of a volt across this one kilo ohm resistor, which equates to a current of about 200 microamps, which might not sound like very much, but it's somewhere in the vicinity of 1.3 quadrillion electrons per second traveling through that resistor. Now that makes it sound like a lot, but if we wait another few microseconds until the circuit reaches steady state, we get a significantly larger current, 1.7 milliamps or 10 quadrillion electrons per second. So if you were watching the video just to find out if Derek was wrong and you made it this far, here's the data. You get a tiny little bit of current immediately almost immediately, probably not quite as fast as he said. But after you wait for the signal to go all the way down the wire and all the way back, you get a much larger signal that shows up and actually turns the light bulb on. In my mind, if a light bulb is capable of turning on with this much current, it's probably going to, you know, burn out and explode with this much current. So if this is your situation, you can turn on a light bulb with that little current, you've done a terrible job at designing your circuit. But the fact remains, there is a tiny little bit of current right there and it's flowing. And it's flowing almost immediately, which is weird. So to help imagine this bonus current, let's take a look at the circuit from the top down. When you flip the switch, you start current flowing in the wire and the electrons in the wire start moving around in a loop. That's what electricity is. But if we account for the light speed delay, you could imagine that all of these electrons don't start moving at the same time. 
there's a wave that travels through them that gets each electron started on its way. And only when that wave reaches the light bulb do the electrons in the light bulb start moving and turn the light bulb on. This extra current that we see immediately then can't come from this primary wave down the wire. It doesn't have time to get there. It has to be something else. It's actually a second wave that starts at the light bulb, almost immediately flowing a very small amount of current through that light bulb. And then it travels down the wire to meet the first wave. But only once the first wave makes it all the way back to the light bulb, does the bulb turn on all the way. So how does current flowing in this wire start current flowing in this parallel but effectively disconnected wire? I'd say that there are two possibilities, capacitance and induction. And because most transmission line models ignore the cross inductance, at least for today, I will too. But to understand how these wires act like a capacitor, we need to know a little more about why electrons flow. Yes, when you have a wire like this, that's just a bare wire hanging out in the air, the power that is being transmitted through this wire is being transmitted through the electric field around the wire. You can't just have a battery that flows current out into nothing and then somewhere else you're drawing power out and a light bulb turns on because of the magic of the pointing field. Like wires are important. Wires are the guides for electrons and for our power. I actually really liked the chain in a tube example that Derek used in his video uh, because you need to make almost no changes to that to make it extremely accurate. So I have this uh, set up here. I've covered a bunch of things with paper so it's a little easier to see. These wires are basically invisible when you stretch them out over a field, which makes it one, hard to set up and two, very hard to film. If you see this whole bunch of stuff, you should see battery and switch. And this, you should just imagine as light bulb and everywhere that these probes show up, really accurate clock. Other than that, we just have these wires that stretch out two this way in a big loop and two that way in a big loop. So for a moment, entertain the idea that electrons are actually little charged hard spheres. I know that that's not technically what they are if you want to go into the full wave function, but for a lot of cases, you can gain a lot of intuition by thinking about them as actual physical particles. So if we imagine that this wire right now is full of electrons, say it's like one line of electrons, the trick to metals is that in metals, due to some really cool solid state physics, electrons are actually able to move long distances. And when I say long distances, I don't mean like down a transmission line, I mean like millimeters. Because most electrons in most solids, even most of the electrons in a metal, are actually restricted to moving within a few angstroms. You know, every atomic nuclei is only spaced out by a couple nanometers, and if an electron is never allowed to leave its own atomic nucleus, then, you know, it's, it's hardly going to move at all. So to move millimeters is enormous, and that's what we're leveraging when we use wires to transmit electric power. Now, when I connect this circuit up, again, imagine that this is just battery and switch. When I flip that switch, the battery starts pumping electrons from one side to the other. That's all a battery does, is basically remove an electron from this wire and set it at the end of this wire. Then we've got too many electrons over here. This electron that we just placed, the battery pumped into this wire, is going to repel the next electron in the chain, the next negatively charged thing. And then that electron's going to be, it's gonna move a little bit and it's going to repel the next electron, which is gonna move a little bit. And all of them are going to start moving at once. You know, once that, that ripple, that wave of motion reaches the end of the line. Over here, we're actually doing the opposite. We're pulling electrons out of this wire so that we can put them over here, which means that we don't have enough electrons over here. So it actually ends up taking on a positive charge because there aren't enough electrons to shield out the positive static electric fields from all of the atomic nuclei. And that means that nearby electrons are actually attracted to this region. Another way to think about it is that this electron used to be repelled equally by both of these electrons on both sides of it. And when we take this one away, it's only being pushed from this side. So it ends up moving in towards the battery. And both of those waves of motion travel down the line at approximately the speed of light because 
the interaction between electrons is actually modulated by photons, by light. Like, how does this electron right here know that this electron is too close to it, so it wants to start moving that way? It knows because of the electromagnetic field, and the electromagnetic field is modulated by photons, and information about the electromagnetic field travels at the speed of light. So what does this say about the chain in a tube model? Well, uh, I would say that the chain in the tube model can be made extremely accurate if you say that the, ch that the chain links are actually bigger than the tube. The tube still constrains the motion of the chain links. Like, you can't have an electron leave the wire. But the electron, the sphere of influence of the electron is actually much larger than the wire. So this electron need not only interact with the one right next to it. You can draw, if you, if you drew all these electrons as dots, you could draw springs between all of them. And considering that they're only allowed to move in a line here, you know, the farther away springs are weaker and, and so on, but they all really do still interact with each other. Which begs the question, can this electron right here interact with an electron in this wire? And the answer to that is yes. And that is the absolute core of this thought experiment, now real experiment, and why we just saw the effects that we did. If you think about this top-down view again, the spot where this wavefront lives actually has too many electrons in it. Electrons are moving towards this point from one side, but they aren't moving away from this point on the other side. So we must be accumulating a little bit of negative charge right here. And that little pocket of negative charge is going to have a net electric field. Likewise, on the other side, we have a region that's depleted of electrons, meaning that this little spot is actually positively charged and it emits its own net static electric field. Now, imagine an electron sitting on this wire. It's free to move and it's simultaneously repelled from this pocket of negative charge and attracted to this pocket of positive charge. So it accelerates this way and passes through the light bulb. It's not a lot of current, but it's almost immediate because as soon as these waves leave the battery, we get this charge imbalance that reaches across the air gap with electric fields and pushes electrons around without the far ends of the wire even knowing. Okay, so I just ran all the way down. This is the end of the line. This is the wire that goes to the light bulb. This is the wire that goes to the switch. Two empty wires down here. Without changing any of the triggering or anything, I'm gonna fire this again. And I would expect that we still see this blip, but then it drops back down to zero. Oh, well, there we go. Yeah, it sort of fluctuates around and then it drops back down. And the current through the uh, near side also drops down. Once it charges up the capacitor that is the two wires, it stops. That's really cool. So for the first 1.6 microseconds of this circuit being on, it is bound by the laws of relativity to look exactly like the trace from when the wires were fully connected. We have to wait 1.6 microseconds for the oscilloscope and the resistors and all the bits that we're measuring to be able to learn that the end of the wire doesn't exist and then they start behaving differently. But there's a bunch of stuff that happens after that light speed delay that is really interesting. So this green trace right here is showing the current through one of the resistors that's right next to the battery and switch. And that says that there's some current flowing at the beginning, but then that current actually sort of dies off after a while. So here we have the battery tirelessly pumping electrons from one side to the other, except eventually all those electrons pile up because we've cut the end of the wire, they have nowhere to go. And the battery stops being able to pump electrons. The most interesting thing about this plot is actually the fact that the white trace reverses briefly. That means that we push a whole bunch of current through the light bulb but then when it runs into the ends of the wires that are cut, that current actually sort of sloshes back and we get electrons that are bouncing back and forth on the line like a wave through a slinky. I don't want to get into how electronic resonators work because I don't know enough to do that topic 
remote justice. But I do know that you need both capacitance, the ability to basically store charge and resist changes in potential, and inductance, the ability to give charges inertia and resist changes in current. And the combination of those two things can actually result in a circuit that bounces back and forth and back and forth. And that's what we're seeing right here. But yeah, without um, calling up Einstein and saying that we found that information can go faster than light, we are always going to have the first 1.6 microseconds look exactly the same. I think that's really cool. Okay, so if you disconnect both ends of the wire, you still get that transient and then it sort of bounces around and, and eventually goes away to zero. But it never actually turns on the light bulb all the way because you can't flow current through a wire that's disconnected. Now I want to see what happens when the two loops of wire are different lengths. Okay, I'm sorry. I really honestly hate to do this. I, I Also just because I want to be done editing. But I've been editing and editing and it looks like it's going to be some 45 minute monstrosity. So I decided to break the rest of the experiment variants off into their own part two video. I had so much fun with this project and I actually learned a lot by fiddling with the geometry of the wires and trying out different things and different variations on the experiment. I got some results that I really wasn't expecting, like, at all. And I want to be able to take the time to properly explain all of those weird results in a second video. As one of the now many replies to Derek's thought experiment, I hope that this video has been more enlightening than confusing. There are a lot of things going on here. It is a deceptively complex problem. And there are a bunch of pieces of physics that I think are important that didn't even make it into this video. So I hope that the capacitive wires hypothesis that I have proposed here makes sense. And I hope that you'll stick around and join me for the part two video. I will plan to see you there.